Chapter 12 Years in my master's hermitage You have come Shri Yukteswar greeted me from a tiger skin on the floor of a balconied sitting room His voice was cold his manner unemotional Yes dear master I am here to follow you Kneeling I touched his feet How can that be You ignore my wishes No longer Guruji your wish shall be my law. That is better. Now I can assume responsibility for your life. I willingly transfer the burden, Master. My first request, then, is that you return home to your family. I want you to enter college in Calcutta. Your education should be continued. Very well, sir. I hid my consternation. Would importunate books pursue me down the years? First father, now Sri Yukteswar. Someday you will go to the West. Its people will lend ears more receptive to India's ancient wisdom if the strange Hindu teacher has a university degree. You know best, Guruji. My gloom departed. The reference to the West I found puzzling, remote, but my opportunity to please master by obedience was vitally immediate. You will be near in Calcutta. Come here whenever you find time. Every day if possible, Master. Gratefully I accept your authority in every detail of my life on one condition. Yes. That you promise to reveal God to me. An hour-long verbal tussle ensued. A Master's word cannot be falsified, it is not lightly given. The implications in the pledge open out vast metaphysical vistas. A guru must be on intimate terms indeed with the creator before he can obligate him to appear. I sensed Sri Yukteswar's divine unity, and was determined, as his disciple, to press my advantage. You are of exacting disposition. Then master's consent rang out with compassionate finality. Let your wish be my wish. Lifelong shadow lifted from my heart, the vague search, hither and yon, was over. I had found eternal shelter in a true guru. Come, I will show you the hermitage. Master rose from his tiger mat. I glanced about me, my gaze fell with astonishment on a wall picture, garlanded with a spray of jasmine. Lahiri Mahasher. Yes, my divine guru. Sri Yukteswar's tone was reverently vibrant. Greater he was, as man and yogi than any other teacher whose life came within the range of my investigations. Silently I bowed before the familiar picture. Soul homage sped to the peerless master who, blessing my infancy, had guided my steps to this hour. Led by my guru, I strolled over the house and its grounds. Large, ancient and well-built, the hermitage was surrounded by a massive pillared courtyard. Outer walls were moss-covered, pigeons fluttered over the flat grey roof, unceremoniously sharing the ashram quarters. A rear garden was pleasant with jackfruit, mango, and plantain trees. Balustrade balconies of upper rooms in the two-storied building faced the courtyard from three sides. A spacious ground floor hall, with high ceilings supported by colonnades, was used, master said, chiefly during the annual festivities of Durga Puja. A narrow stairway led to Sri Yukteswar's sitting room, whose small balcony overlooked the street. The ashram was plainly furnished, everything was simple, clean, and utilitarian. Several western-style chairs, benches, and tables were in evidence. Master invited me to stay overnight. A supper of vegetable curry was served by two young disciples who were receiving hermitage training. Guruji, please tell me something of your life. I was squatting on a straw mat near his tiger skin. The friendly stars were very close, it seemed, beyond the balcony. My family name was Priya Nath Karal. I was born here in Serampore, where father was a wealthy businessman. He left me this ancestral mansion, now my hermitage. My formal schooling was little, I found it slow and shallow. In early manhood, I undertook the responsibilities of a householder, and have one daughter, now married. 
My middle life was blessed with the guidance of Lahiri Mahashaya. After my wife died, I joined the Swami order and received the new name of Sri Yukteswar Giri. Such are my simple annals. Master smiled at my eager face. Like all biographical sketches, his words had given the outward facts without revealing the inner man. Guruji, I would like to hear some stories of your childhood. I will tell you a few each one with a moral. Sri Yukteswar's eyes twinkled with his warning. My mother once tried to frighten me with an appalling story of a ghost in a dark chamber. I went there immediately and expressed my disappointment at having missed the ghost. Mother never told me another horror tale. Moral, look fear in the face and it will cease to trouble you. Another early memory is my wish for an ugly dog belonging to a neighbor. I kept my household in turmoil for weeks to get that dog. My ears were deaf to offers of pets with more prepossessing appearance. Moral, attachment is blinding. It lends an imaginary halo of attractiveness to the object of desire. A third story concerns the plasticity of the youthful mind. I heard my mother remark occasionally, a man who accepts a job under anyone is a slave. That impression became so indelibly fixed that even after my marriage I refused all positions. I met expenses by investing my family endowment in land. Moral, good and positive suggestions should instruct the sensitive ears of children. Their early ideas long remain sharply etched. Master fell into tranquil silence. Around midnight he led me to a narrow cot. Sleep was sound and sweet the first night under my guru's roof. Sri Yukteswar chose the following morning to grant me his Kriya Yoga initiation. The technique I had already received from two disciples of Lahiri Mahashev father and my tutor, Swami Keblananda but in master's presence I felt transforming power. At his touch, a great light broke upon my being, like glory of countless suns blazing together. A flood of ineffable bliss, overwhelming my heart to an innermost core, continued during the following day. It was late that afternoon before I could bring myself to leave the hermitage. You will return in 30 days. As I reached my Calcutta home, the fulfillment of Master's prediction entered with me. None of my relatives made the pointed remarks I had feared about the reappearance of the soaring bird. I climbed to my little attic and bestowed affectionate glances, as though on a living presence. You have witnessed my meditations, and the tears and storms of my sadhana. Now I have reached the harbor of my divine teacher. Son, I am happy for us both. Father and I sat together in the evening calm. You have found your guru, as in miraculous fashion I once found my own. The holy hand of Lahiri Mahashir is guarding our lives. Your master has proved no inaccessible Himalayan saint, but one nearby. My prayers have been answered. You have not in your search for God been permanently removed from my sight. Father was also pleased that my formal studies would be resumed. He made suitable arrangements. I was enrolled the following day at the Scottish Church College in Calcutta. Happy months sped by. My readers have doubtless made the perspicacious surmise that I was little seen in the college classrooms. The Serampore Hermitage held a lure too irresistible. Master accepted my ubiquitous presence without comment. To my relief, he seldom referred to the halls of learning. Though it was plain to all that I was never cut out for a scholar, I managed to attain minimum passing grades from time to time. Daily life at the ashram flowed smoothly, infrequently varied. My guru awoke before dawn. Lying down, or sometimes sitting on the bed, he entered a state of samadhi. It was simplicity itself to discover when master had awakened, abrupt halt of stupendous snows. A sigh or two, perhaps a bodily movement. Then a soundless state of breathlessness, he was in deep yogic joy. Breakfast did not follow, first came a long walk by the Ganges. Those morning strolls with my Guru how real and vivid still. In the easy resurrection of memory, 
I often find myself by his side. The early sun is warming the river. His voice rings out, rich with the authenticity of wisdom. A bath, then the midday meal. Its preparation, according to Master's daily directions, had been the careful task of young disciples. My guru was a vegetarian. Before embracing monkhood, however, he had eaten eggs and fish. His advice to students was to follow any simple diet which proved suited to one's constitution. Master ate little, often rice, colored with turmeric or juice of beets or spinach and lightly sprinkled with buffalo ghee or melted butter. Another day he might have lentil dal or channa curry with vegetables. For dessert, mangoes or oranges with rice pudding or jackfruit juice, visitors appeared in the afternoons. A steady stream poured from the world into the hermitage tranquility. Everyone found in master an equal courtesy and kindness. To a man who has realized himself as a soul, not the body or the ego, the rest of humanity assumes a striking similarity of aspect. The impartiality of saints is rooted in wisdom. Masters have escaped Maya, its alternating faces of intellect, and it is no longer cast an influential glance. Sri Yukteswar showed no special consideration to those who happened to be powerful or accomplished, neither did he slight others for their poverty or illiteracy. He would listen respectfully to words of truth from a child and openly ignore a conceited pundit. Eight o'clock was the supper hour and sometimes found lingering guests. My guru would not excuse himself to eat alone, none left his ashram hungry or dissatisfied. Sri Yukteswar was never at a loss, never dismayed by unexpected visitors, scanty food would emerge a banquet under his resourceful direction. Yet he was economical, his modest funds went far. Be comfortable within your purse, he often said. Sir, have you not been single-heartedly seeking God for a long time? I have not done much. Bihari must have told you something of my life. For 20 years I occupied a secret grotto, meditating 18 hours a day. Then I moved to a more inaccessible cave and remained there for 25 years, entering the yoga union for 20 hours daily. I did not need sleep, for I was ever with God. My body was more rested in the complete calmness of the superconsciousness than it could be by the partial peace of the ordinary subconscious state. The muscles relax during sleep, but the heart, lungs, and circulatory system are constantly at work, they get no rest. In superconsciousness, the internal organs remain in a state of suspended animation, electrified by the cosmic energy. By such means I have found it unnecessary to sleep for years. The time will come when you too will dispense with sleep. My goodness, you have meditated for so long and yet are unsure of the Lord's favor. I gazed at him in astonishment. Then what about us poor mortals? Well, don't you see, my dear boy, that God is eternity itself, to assume that one can fully know. Him by 45 years of meditation is rather a preposterous expectation. Babaji assures us, however, that even a little meditation saves one from the dire fear of death and after death states. Do not fix your spiritual ideal on a small mountain, but hitch it to the star of unqualified divine attainment. If you work hard, you will get there. Enthralled by the prospect, I asked him for further enlightening words. He related a wondrous story of his first meeting with Lahiri Mahash's guru, Babaji. Thirteen to three around midnight Ram Gopal fell into silence, and I lay down on my blankets. Closing my eyes, I saw flashes of lightning, the vast space within me was a chamber of molten light. I opened my eyes and observed the same dazzling radiance. The room became a part of that infinite vault which I beheld with interior vision. Why don't you go to sleep? Sir, how can I sleep in the presence of lightning, blazing whether my eyes are shut or open? You are blessed to have this experience. The spiritual radiations are not easily seen. The saint added a few words of affection. 
At dawn Ram Gopal gave me rock candies and said I must depart. I felt such reluctance to bid him farewell that tears coursed down my cheeks. I will not let you go empty-handed. The yogi spoke tenderly. I will do something for you. He smiled and looked at me steadfastly. I stood rooted to the ground, peace rushing like a mighty flood through the gates of my eyes. I was instantaneously healed of a pain in my back, which had troubled me intermittently for years. Renewed, bathed in a sea of luminous joy, I wept no more. After touching the saint's feet, I sauntered into the jungle, making my way through its tropical tangle until I reached Tarkeswar. There I made a second pilgrimage to the famous shrine and prostrated myself fully before the altar. The round stone enlarged before my inner vision until it became the cosmical sphere, ring within ring, zone after zone, all dowered with divinity. I entrained happily and are later for Calcutta. My travels ended not in the lofty mountains but in the Himalayan presence of my master.